Welcome, partners. I'm Kyle DeWitt, uh, Vice President of Technical Services here at ScanSource, and I'm glad you've joined us for a new series of content that we're creating on returning to the office uh, as our industries begin this transition to what we internally call the next normal. Uh, our customers are looking to us to help them navigate the technology challenges associated with getting back into the office. Today, we're bringing you a panel discussion specifically focused on returning to the office in kind of the enterprise space. Uh, we're going to weave in a, a sub theme here on uh, safety and security. And as such, uh, joining me on the panel today, I have a, a few experts from our suppliers. We have uh, Hanwha, uh, Seek Thermal, and Mitel represented. So uh, thank you three gentlemen for joining us. Um, and we'll be discussing the trends that they are seeing uh, in this space. So I'll start uh, with introductions here quickly, and then we'll come back to you guys and, uh, and let you uh, dig in a little bit more on your role. Uh, so first, uh, going around my screen here uh, from Hanwha, we have uh, Thomas, AKA Tom Cook, who is a SVP of sales uh, from North America for Hanwha, representing uh, Seek Thermal. We have Mike Minch, who's president and CEO uh, of for Seek Thermal, and then uh, Brent Jarvis from Mitel, who is the senior director uh, over IT security and compliance. So again, thank you three uh, for joining us today. Um, Tom, I'll start with you. Uh, why don't you give us a little bit of an introduction into uh, your role with Hanwha and then uh, start taking us down the path of how you guys are enabling your partners and customers to get back into the office. Sure, thank you, Kyle. Um, again, as, as Kyle mentioned, I'm the Senior Vice President of Hanwha for North America. Uh, Hanwha Techwin is the camera security division of a, a large conglomerate called Hanwha. It's about a $60 billion corporation. You probably use every one of their products. Uh, it's the largest manufacturer of, of mechanical plastics in the world um, in, in every type of product you can imagine. But anyway, um, what we are seeing today is a, a change of business on how you know, we're going about things and then helping our security integrators on applying uh, new applications, cameras, and, and things that can help people go back to the office safely utilizing surveillance cameras. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, Mike, I'll, I'll come to you next, uh, partially because of the layout on my screen right now, but there's some continuity here for sure, right? We, uh, we kind of smiled about it in the intro, but I, I literally can't walk into the office without seeing uh, Seek Thermal. So uh, why don't you give us an introduction into uh, your role uh, with Seek and uh, the same thing, how you guys are helping partners and customers get back into the office safely. Yeah, so um, as, as Kyle mentioned, um, I'm the president and CEO of Seek Thermal. Seek Thermal is a privately held company located in Santa Barbara, California, um, which is one of the uh, kind of the um, hubs of the thermal in imaging world. And uh, we've been in business since 2012, um, founded by a couple of uh, entrepreneurs with a long and extensive history in the thermal imaging space, uh, both having spent their entire career uh, in, that, in that space um, with really the goal uh, at, here at Seek Thermal of making thermal imaging a part of everyday life. Yeah, if I'm looking forward to digging in um, into it, what you were describing there about giving your uh, customers and their customers that peace of mind. Um, and uh, for sure, we'll come back and uh, yep. dig into that. Um, and then we have, uh, last but not least, Brent Jarvis uh, representing Mitel. Um, I get to geek out a little bit on Mitel. That's my background uh, at ScanSource. So mm -hmm. I haven't plugged my own organization yet, but. Uh, I manage the pre and post sales support engineers for ScanSource that support our, our uh, North American VAR community and had a long history with Mitel on the product side. Um, and I know, Brent, you're in the um, you know, IT space within Mitel. So why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, your role there at Mitel and uh, how that's uh, involved in uh, working with our partners right now? Sure. Yeah. My, my role at Mitel, I'm uh, the senior director of uh, security and compliance. Um, my responsibility is around security operations uh, for both the cloud and the corporate environment. Um, also responsible for the governance, risk, and compliance uh, area of the business where we uh, focus on, on making our cloud platforms compliant with uh, several uh, important uh, areas like uh, SOC 2 and uh, HIPAA. 
Uh, further to that, um, I am also responsible for the security and incident response process. So anytime there's a, a product issue, uh, there's a cloud uh, platform issue, uh, my team gets engaged and we follow a fairly stringent process to uh, adhere to regulatory requirements, customer notifications and such. Yeah, thank you for that. And I, I would be remiss in this uh, introduction phase of the panel that um, I didn't also let our audience off the hook with our uh, ambiguity around the use of security and it's intentional. And uh, so we have some, uh, some physical security experts on this call uh, as well as IT security. And, and like I said, it's intentional that we're trying to uh, cast a wide net here. Uh, they're all business practices that ScanSource is involved in uh, as well as our suppliers. So Tom, let's, uh, let's come back to you and kind of dig into the, the topic at hand now. Um, and as uh, SVP, you're responsible for a sales channel uh, where there's lots of opportunities coming up right now that are trying to address challenges as, uh, as our workforce goes back into the office or back into schools or back into healthcare, what have you. But what are you uh, seeing as uh, one of the most significant challenges in getting back into the, the traditional office space? Well, the first thing is funding. I think... Uh, you know, a lot of people think, uh, you know, there are options out there. There are plenty of options from uh, temperature detection camera to social distancing apps and, and wearable bands and, and, and many, many things uh, companies like ourselves and Seek and other companies are coming up with. And, and they're very good. But the first thing we have to think about, every company has to get extra funding to do this, to make their environment safer or, or different than what it was in the past and didn't require that. Uh, before you had a, a, an access control do door, maybe for the front building and you didn't even have a camera, maybe a camera just to make sure it wasn't vandalized. At this point, you have to look at the camera to either check temperature, social distance, a mask or no mask, uh, count how many people come into your facility, uh, maximums and things like that. These are just four things you, know, you probably want to enforce uh, on that, but it takes money. It takes uh, money and the commitment from the company and management. So when we talk with our integrators, one, we want to educate them on the technology that we offer, uh, which through our cameras, we can do most of all of that. Uh, and two, we want to, just like um, going through funding or budgeting for putting in a, a regular security system, we ask them to talk with the customer about how much do you want to allocate? Just like building an addition on your house. You have to figure out, are you going to spend money? And you have to uh, recognize that this is going to take money. You're not going to have a person standing there counting people at the entranceway of a Home Depot. It's just not right. Uh, you have to figure out technology because right now, this is what we're dealing with. The future, probably going to be the same, vaccine or no vaccine. Yeah. Yeah. And I think uh, one of the key there is uh, using human beings to count other human beings, uh, temporary fix. It's not scalable. Uh, no. and, and that's not what you want your human capital uh, being used for, for sure. Um, uh, Brent, um, I'm kind of going uh, by script here, but I, I for sure want to yeah. come to you uh, just to hear just internally uh, within Mitel. I mean, we're all in this uh, environment now where um, we're trying to support either remote workers or hybrid workforce and not a hundred percent of people are going back in the office. We all get that uh, to Tom's point. This is, you know, this is new and we're not going back to the way that we used, uh, we used to operate. Um, so there's going to be investments made in technology. We're all having to, to navigate that, but uh, can you give us a little bit of an insight on uh, what Mitel did and, and how you guys transitioned your workforce? Uh, I see you're working from home. Um, how you made that transition sure. and uh, anything that you had to put in place to make sure that it was done safely and securely? Yeah, I can certainly say the, the transition was quite seamless because we're in the business of, of uh, supplying those services and we use them. We get our own dog food, as, as people would say. Um, the, uh, you know, so the move, move to home, very seamless. Move back is going to be seamless, but we're still at that state where we're evaluating. Um, the, um, you know, the one challenge we did have was, you know, some of our lab, um, uh, workers, they did have a need to be able to connect to devices in the network and then have some sets at home in order to run some tests. 
And so we did have to find a solution for that where um, they could have that um, full connectivity. The, the VPN that we had in place wouldn't satisfy that need. And so we, we did have to reach out and, and purchase a, a solution that has been very effective for that. Um, allowing those engineers not ha- not to have to be in the office and considered essential workers. The other interesting thing I was going to say is, you know, from a safety perspective, our, our HR and, and a full team has been doing uh, employee surveys to see what they're comfortable with when they go back to the office. Would they, um, you know, consider wearing masks? Um, are, are they comfortable being a certain distance from, from their, you know, cube mates? And even, you know, contact tracing, would they be comfortable having a contact tracing app running on their mobile so that should that event happen when someone does uh, come up with COVID that we can quickly uh, identify who else could be affected uh, in the area? Yep, you get the gold star. Um, I think we're on session number five of this and you're the first one to bring up contract contact tracing. So uh, I'm glad it's, you broke space. It's, it's a, yeah, it's a very interesting um, technology now, Mike. I'm coming to you. Get ready to talk about thermal scanning and and uh, you know uh, Thomas talked about uh, deploying cameras, monitoring uh, traffic in and out of buildings. Um, you brought up uh, what are com- what are employees uh, comfortable with, uh, Brent, and what do they feel they need in their workspace to to uh, to feel safe as they come in, but. Um, Mike, as we come to you and talk a little bit about uh, about your specific space, you know, one of the, the themes there is um, we're having to deploy things that are, are keeping our employees safe. Um, and one of the elements of doing so responsibly is, you know, just asking, you know, essentially asking them for consent. Like, are you OK when you come into the office to wear a mask, to have to use hand sanitizer for us to empty the conference rooms every two hours so we can sanitize it? Are you OK with us scanning your temperature when you walk in? So there's a for sure the workplace is going to be different. And uh, for those that don't feel comfortable, um, you know, Brent, that's, uh, that's why we pose this one to you, right? So for those that don't feel comfortable, mm-hmm. what do you what do we do to enable uh, that remote worker to be a remote worker forever? Um, so, so Mike, we'll, uh, we'll come to you. I definitely want to, you know, geek out on on uh, seek a little bit. But, um, you know, your product in this space, this uh, temperature scanning space is like you said, it seems uh, a tremendous amount of uh, popularity right now. It's very timely. Um, it the, the technology itself isn't brand new, but the, again, though, as we said, kind of in one of our uh, our openers, this is the new business case, and this is yep. uh, like said it's very uh, very prevalent. So, uh, what do our partners need to know about deploying thermal scanning uh, as it relates to? Uh, employees that are being scanned, uh, and, uh, yeah, employees that are being scanned and or customers that are being scanned, uh, what are their best practices? Are there any uh, liability responsibilities, that kind of thing? Yeah, so I guess maybe the best place to start uh, in answering that would, would just be to maybe describe what, what thermal scanning can and can't do. So I think it's really important because um, like any new technology and any opportunity, there's often a lot of uh, opportunists in the marketplace with technology making claims that are oftentimes much, much uh, uh, wilder and broader than they than they really should be. And it's often difficult, especially for a, uh, maybe a somewhat more arcane technology like thermal imaging for people to really kind of cut through all of that and understand what's important to me. So I'd say first and foremost, it's really important understanding that, you know, thermal screening, and it doesn't matter whether you're talking about $20,000 um, systems that you see deployed in airports monitoring 10, 15, 20 people at a time, or you're talking about the $60 um, a temporal thermometer that you're buying from um, CVS and having somebody stand at a door and point at your forehead. In all of those cases, thermal scanning does not give you um, 100% assurance that somebody is uh, sick. That, that they have a fever. Um, all it's telling you is that they have elevated skin temperature. Yep. And generally speaking, elevated skin temperature is a proxy for elevated body temperature. And elevated body temperature is oftentimes a proxy for fever. So it's really important to understand that number one, thermal scanning does not do a medical diagnosis. It's not a medical device and it should never be used in that way. And if you even look at the guidelines that the FDA has put out for the use of thermal scanning, 
And there are guidelines that they've come out with that I would encourage your partners to, to, uh, to read and understand at a real top level. Um, some of the things that they talk about have, have to do with the technology that's employed in thermal scanning that they, that they uh, agree with, the methodology that's used in thermal scanning that they agree with, and um, have kind of provided those guidelines. Since it's not a medical device, it's not regulated by FDA from that standpoint, or at least the FDA has said at this point in time that they don't require you know, a 510 filing or FDA approval for the marketing of such devices. Um, now that may change in the future, but today that's not, that's not something that's required. Um, the, the next piece is really kind of what some of those components are in thermal scanning. Uh, or I should say, uh, because it's not a medical device, the data that's associated with it is also not considered HIPAA data. Yeah. So you talked a little bit earlier about, you know, what can employers consent to or not consent to? And the general feeling from the FDA is at this point in time, that's not considered a medical examination, therefore not covered by the privacy issues associated with HIPAA. Um, so, so from that standpoint, um, those are some of the, the key things to understand. Probably the most important things in terms of the actual technologies deployed would be things like, is there a heat reference source in, in the, in the uh, product or not? There's a heat reference source is something that is, helps the camera give you the kind of precision that you need to really detect elevated body temperature. Because typical traditional industrial thermal imaging products don't have that level of uh, accuracy uh, and precision as, as uh, devices that are purpose built for the purposes of uh, elevated body temperature. So having a, a, heat, a heat reference source in the picture is, is very important. Secondly, having enough resolution in the number of pixels that are in the camera to be able to detect multiple places on the face so that you can find the places on the face that have the best temperature markers is also really important. So some of the systems that are being sold as quote unquote thermal scanning may only use 10 or 15 pixels to make that determination. And with 10 or 15 pixels, you're, you're not gonna see very much of the area you're looking at, let alone an entire face when you're looking at that. Yeah. On the other hand, there's some very sophisticated cameras with many, many pixels that can give you that kind of precision. So that gives you a little bit of an idea maybe for, for your audience of some of the things that they should be thinking about when they're looking at thermal scanning. But the key thing to take away is thermal scanning is, is not a end-all be-all solution for safety in the workplace. It's, a, it's one of a suite of technologies. And even the FDA talks about best practices is you have this as a first line of defense, but you wanna make sure you have, you know, a second, what happens if somebody triggers it? That doesn't mean they have a fever. It doesn't mean they have COVID. It doesn't mean they have a condition. It means you need to have a way to then say, well, can you step aside so we can take it to the next step and do a different type of screening with you? And ultimately come to a medical diagnosis of if somebody have, have an issue or not. Yeah, yeah, I think, so I love that answer. Um, I, I know our partners that aren't already in this space and, and Tom probably uh, can echo this, but the, par the partners that aren't in this space that are being asked about it do have some of the, the natural concerns that you just alleviated. You know, this is not a medical procedure that, that you don't need to store data uh, to begin with, but even if you were happen to, you know, store right. data, it's not considered protected uh, by HIPAA. So there's all kinds of, um, you know, FUD around, uh, around this technology and the way it's being used right now. And so I, lo I love that answer. Uh, I'm, probably going to call back to that here in a minute as we, uh, as we kind of wrap up and, and, and talk about uh, what we can all do to, to help our partners. Um, but I, I think uh, for our audience today, it's going to be immensely uh, useful. Uh, and here's where I'll just take a, a, a selfish five seconds uh, to, <laughs> to call back to my own uh, opener about having pre and post sale uh, within ScanSource. But our role mutually, you guys and us, is to play the advisor role to our partners. And so we've got resources uh, within our companies that can represent your products to our customers 
uh, our mutual customers as they're running into these opportunities to help them make informed decisions on um, what they can deploy and what their responsibilities are for uh, for doing so. Um, so Tom, we'll come back to you as we go kind of uh, around the horn here um, to wrap things up and um, we're all uh, you know channel centric here, but uh, so we, we all uh, service resellers and and uh, and a lot of times their customers downstream. So um, how about let's uh, let's wrap up with a you know best piece of advice for our resellers as they start to address their cu uh, customers' needs for getting back into the office. Yeah, thanks, Kyle. Uh, I, I I agree with Mike who say you know a lot of these technologies are not 100%. Uh, we we have uh, thermal cameras and but we have AI cameras now, artificial intelligent cameras on the market that can do uh, social distancing six feet apart and enunciate on the camera, uh, say hey please step away from each other or mask no mask and say please put your mask on uh, or occupancy and count how many people but it's artificial intelligence not analytics, still not a hundred percent technically. 92% uh, is fantastic. So what we try and do and, and, and working with ScanSource as being one of our best distributors, we train your people to also talk with the installers, the integrators, the dealers on not to overcommit 100%. It's going to, everything works and don't worry about it. There's going to be a miscount if somebody's tailgating. There's going to be, you know, um, things that might happen. Um, thermal detection, obviously, Mike couldn't explain it better, but you, we, everyone has to educate the integrator so they can educate the end user to what their expectations will be. I think that is the critical piece going forward. We have a lot of cool stuff. We have stuff that will help. Mike said it best. It's just one line of defense. Uh, m multiply that with maybe some of our cameras with Mike's cameras, put them together if you know to put together a safety security system for the lobby, the hotel, a K through 12, whatever office building. That's when you start making a better system. You know, security is like designing from your asset out. You know, if you had a vault, you put something in the vault and then the building and then outside the building. We're doing the same thing with technology for COVID and viruses, but they have to be combined. Nothing's 100%, and we have to educate and train the, the dealers and the end users, and this is part of it right now, is to talk about, do your research, understand what's out there, and understand, you know, it's not 100%. Yeah, well, uh, Brent, I'm gonna come to you uh, next here as we kind of wrap up, and I know in, uh, in your space, you're like, hey, well, five nines is great. It's not 100%, but it's pretty darn close, right? Um, but just shifting uh, between our different uses of security, um, your your own internal workforce, as well as our partners and their customers, um, you know, implementing new any any piece of new technology that lives on the network introduces um, some kind of network security uh, concern for sure. You also have a remote workforce that's bring in their own devices that are using um, home tablets and things like that. But um, as we get back into the office, I think maybe the general assumption is some of those concerns go away. Um, I don't believe that that's necessarily the case, but curious um, if from your standpoint, um, as Mitel is working with their partners on uh, enabling their customers to come back into the office, even using your products um, remotely and or in the office, uh, whether or not you've got some advice for them on how to make sure that they're securing all their communication, securing these devices, uh, et cetera. Yeah, I, I think I'll, I'll speak to the security, but I, I think the resellers really need to understand the breadth of the uh, communication and collaboration products that are out there because this is, we're in an unknown territory in terms of, uh, you know, COVID. One week you may be in the office and then all of a sudden you're, you're back, right? So, you need to, to have a flexible environment, a flexible bubble policy, and, and have supporting flexible tools that allow you to change at an instant. Um, from a security perspective, the, the things that I worry about, you know, from a corporate standpoint, you've got um, people working from home with their devices, uh, hopefully their corporate devices. 
But sometimes, depending on the size of your company and the tools you have, you may not know what's going on in those devices, right? You're working from home. Um, people may be using their devices for personal use. And, and now they're coming back to the office. Um, you know, it could be that their antivirus isn't up to date anymore if you don't centrally manage that and have the ability for it to reach out to a central server. Windows update, there's been so many Windows updates. Every month there's hundreds of updates that come from from Microsoft, you know, I would recommend that you instruct your um, your staff to, to do a reboot, you know, ensure they're fully patched before they come into the office and make sure their antivirus is running. And then from a monitoring perspective, be ready when they come back to the office, add a little extra eyes to your, you know, your, your SIM, your IDS, and, and just be ready to react because it, it may be that you're going to have a little uptick on, on some of the activity that's going on. Yeah, I think I I don't know how I hadn't considered that before, but it's a it's a fantastic point that we all took um, secure devices home and then worked with them, uh, you know, on the same network as my kid's PlayStation for four or five months. And then I'm going to bring exactly, them back yeah. to the corporate environment. Um, mm -hmm. you know, we're all on VPN, so I feel a little bit uh, um, secure, but uh, that's a natural concern for anybody that picked up, literally picked up, walked out of the office with all their gear and uh, they're going to bring it back unclean. You think it's secure, but you, you know, people are running older routers. There's a lot of router flaws and vulnerabilities out there. You know, you never know, you know, what's happened over the last six or eight months. Um, and, and so you got to be prepared. Yeah. We've got a whole uh, series of, uh, of thought leadership pieces on cybersecurity and, we love to point out that uh, that printer that's sitting over there in the corner is the single easiest way into a network. And uh, those, mm -hmm. those things are sitting on networks and usually uh, fairly unsecure. So yeah, I'm, I'm totally with you there. Um, all right, Mike, uh, you're going to bring us home here. Uh, you already gave uh, maybe inadvertently, I'll, I'll give you credit for doing it advertently, uh, some advice to partners on how to, how to get in uh, to this space. Uh, eliminating some of the fear, but uh, anything else that you want to add in on um, how to enable partners to feel comfortable having conversations around these new technologies? Well, I think I, I think similarly. I think Tom gave some 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 really good some really good advice, both from the standpoint of you know how scalable is the solution that you have. Um, you know, we certainly see people from a cost standpoint looking at saying, well, I'll just go buy some handheld thermometers, and then they they basically burn through more than that and the cost of just a person who's administering that as they as people try to walk through the doors. But, you know, honestly, I would say probably the only other things I would add to the to the uh, to the other comments are, you know, in addition to these technologies really being a stack of things that that are different measures. The primary goal that I think that 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 we have, and it's certainly our case was our workforce has returned to work because um, like you, we eat, we eat our own dog food too, and we have our own screening system set up and all. You know, we, we want to both um, create an environment where we minimize the risk of anybody getting, uh, getting, getting ill, because at, as a relatively small company, um, you know, when we shut down, we shut down the whole company. It's not just one work cell or one floor. It's the whole company shuts down because we're not that big of an organization. And so, um, we're trying to number one avoid that, and number two, we want people to feel confident when they come into work that the company's taking this seriously. So it's not just deploying the technology; it's following the practices of social distancing. It's ensuring that people are wearing masks. It's ensuring that people are wearing gloves. It's keeping people as much as possible out of common spaces. And while it's creating a short-term work environment inconvenience, I think in the long term, really people will be most productive and feel the most comfortable when they feel safe in the working environment that we're asking them to come into. I appreciate the, the comments there. We definitely want our partners uh, not, not preying on the fear um, of their customers and going in and listening to what kinds of challenges they're trying to solve for. And we've got lots of technology solutions uh, represented by you uh, three and others in the uh, scan source portfolio that we can help with. So uh, just in wrapping up, I, I thank you guys, uh, Tom, Mike, uh, Brent, for joining us today. Um, uh, for our partners, uh, as we said in the introduction, this is one of a series of, uh, of events that we're holding uh, thought leadership pieces on this return to office space. There's lots more information on our website. Um, again, thank you, uh, 
Tom, uh, Mike, and Brent from uh, Hanwha, Sea Thermal, and Mitel, respectively, uh, for your time today. And uh, thank you, partners, for your business. And with that, we'll sign off.